Israeli airstrikes continue in Gaza. The worst violence in years is intensifying each day with dozens killed. So far, Israeli and Palestinian leaders are ignoring international calls for calm. So what can be done to avoid a full-scale war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Palestinians in Gaza are marking the end of the Muslim month of Ramadan under a barrage of Israeli airstrikes. Dozens of people have been killed since Monday in the worst violence since 2014. Israel's prime minister says this is just the beginning. Armed groups, including Hamas, fired back rockets into Israel. The escalation has triggered street violence between Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis in several cities. Diplomats from Egypt and Qatar are trying to broker a ceasefire. Israel's staunchest ally, the U.S., is sending an envoy while insisting on Israel's right to self-defense. My expectation and hope is that uh, uh, this will be uh, closing down sooner than later. But uh, Israel has a right to defend itself when you have thousands of rockets flying into your territory. But... Uh, I had a, a conversation for a while with, with the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, I think that uh, my hope is that we'll see uh, this coming to conclusion sooner than later. Palestinian leaders are putting the blame squarely on Israel. The failure of Israel's plans in Jerusalem in the face of our people's steadfastness has pushed it into a bloody aggression against the Gaza Strip. Israel is the aggressor and the occupying power that commits crimes against our people, and it bears full responsibility for that and for violating international law and international humanitarian law. Protests have taken place around the world condemning the violence and to demand an end to Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory. Leaders from Europe, China, Russia and elsewhere are calling for calm. The United Nations Security Council has held two emergency sessions but the U.S. has been blocking attempts to issue a statement. The Secretary General is warning of chaos if the fighting doesn't stop. He and his envoy have called on the international community to take action to enable the parties to step back from the brink and return to the previous understandings that have maintained a relative calm in Gaza and avoid a descent into chaos with the massive casualties and immense damage to civilian infrastructure that that would result. All right, let's bring in our guests in Tel Aviv, Danny Danon, former permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations. In Ramallah, Ammar Hijazi, assistant minister for multilateral affairs of the state of Palestine. And in Washington, D.C., Hillary Mann Leverett, former U.S. diplomat. A warm welcome to you all. Danny, let me start with you today. Does Israel at the moment want to see a diplomatic solution to this crisis? And if so, what steps is it prepared to take to try and de-escalate the situation? Thank you for having me today. And I want to make it clear, Israel had no intention with escalation. We always seek peace. We are a peaceful nation. Unfortunately, Israel is under fire. Last night, I had to run with my two daughters into the shelter. Uh, and millions of Israelis did the same in the last few nights. We are being attacked by a terrorist organization, Hamas, and we are, we are defending ourselves. It will not be quiet uh, in Gaza, and we will hunt down the Hamas terrorists uh, until it will be quiet here in Tel Aviv and in the entire cities in Israel. Ammar, um, let me ask you uh, a somewhat similar question here. Um, so far, what we've heard from both sides in this is uh, there isn't a lot of indication that there is any type of de-escalation de sentiment right now. So um, are the Palestinians prepared to try to de-escalate this? What steps would they want to take? And also, is there a unified Palestinian position on all this? The Palestinians are unified in, in their stance uh, against this aggression. Uh, uh, all Palestinian uh, factions and uh, political uh, parties are standing united against Israel's aggression that started in, in Jerusalem and continued on to Gaza. 
the reality of the matter is that the Palestinian people are continuously under this aggression and under Israel's attack. And uh, this reality needs to end. And we've been uh, appealing and calling in the international community to take steps to end this injustice and to end this occupation, which is the source of all illnesses that we see today. Hillary, let me ask you the role that the U.S. is playing in all this. We know that President Biden really wants to disengage with the Middle East. Um, he wants to focus more on China. And now he is being pulled back into this situation. Is it possible for Biden to actually disengage? And is he doing enough to try to de-escalate the situation? I think it's going to be very difficult for the Biden administration to disengage, uh, no matter how much it may want to do so, in part because the domestic politics in the United States are changing. There is a different Congress today than there was the last time, 2014, that there was this round of of bombing and, and violence uh, in, in the Israeli and Palestinian areas. We have in Congress today, for example, the head of the House Foreign Relations Committee had been a stalwart uh, pro-Israel ally for 30 years. He was ousted in the past election. And now there's a new member of Congress from that district of New York who's much more open to arguments that Palestinians' human rights and civil rights need to be taken very seriously. And you take that real change in Congress that we're seeing with a mood here in the United States that I think is important to understand, where we're seeing constant scenes of police brutality and white supremacist brutality here in the United States. To see similar images in Israel and, Pal and the Palestinian areas has a different, uh, different impression, I think, on particularly on Democrats and progressives who today control the U.S. government. Two years from now, we may it may be a different story. The, the House and Senate may change. Four years from now, the presidency may change. But today, it's in control of the Democrats. President Biden himself is more of an old school Democrat who has this reflexive notion of supporting Israel's right to, right to self-defense. But more and more Democrats, more and more progressives are even saying, what is this right to self-defense? Is it to really dis defend Israeli lives or is it to defend a permanent subjugation of, of Palestinians and Arabs? That kind of conversation hasn't happened in Washington in a very long time. And it could portend a real change in the politics, which will push Biden to take steps to be more engaged than he otherwise would like to be. Danny, we know that the U.S. is sending an envoy uh, to Israel to try to help de-escalate the situation. Do you believe that uh, you will see any benefit out of that trip? I am very uh, skeptical about it because uh, you don't have uh, both sides that you can actually come sit down and negotiate between them. Uh, you can, don't have a dialogue with Hamas. Hamas is a radical organization. And I want to remind you and the audience that uh, during 9-11, after the attack on the Twin Tower in New York City, Hamas issued a statement glorifying the attack. So with all due respect and the good intention of the administration, I don't think you will have a viable dialogue between the side. And our message is being delivered today to the Hamas leaders, and we are hunting them. We are hunting them in the offices, in their homes, in the tunnels. And if they are watching us right now, I'm telling them directly, we will come after you and you will pay a personal price for what you are doing for the citizens of Israel and for the people of Gaza. Ammar, uh, what do you say to all of that? I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, nothing has seemed to be able to try to de-escalate anything at, at the moment. Do you believe that a visit from a U.S. envoy at this particular point in time will help anything? We believe that the U.S. has many tools uh, to bring Israel into abidance and into uh, uh, conformity with international law. Israel has been violating international law for the past, uh, since its, its existence, and it continues to do so. And it's destroying any chances to reach any political solution by its, these actions. Therefore, the U.S. has the responsibility and duty to bring Israel into abidance and to ensure it respects Security Council resolutions, international law, and rights of the Palestinian people. The U.S. is uh, the uh, main financier and supporter of Israel in the international arena. And today, the U.S. can and have enough tools to stop Israel's carnage on our people. Hillary, 
Is there a perceptible shift right now in the U.S. when it comes to public opinion uh, about what's going on uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians? I think there is a very important shift in elite public opinion. Elite political public opinion among political elites, particularly here in Washington and other major cities in the United States, what they're seeing is that uh, particularly major American donors to the Republican Party and to extreme parts of the Republican Party are similar donors to extreme right-wing nationalists in Israel. And so more and more, particularly Democratic Party elites, are becoming disenchanted with these American voters who are funding, fueling, voting for right-wing extreme parties in the United States and right-wing extremists in Israel. The issue of Israel used to be much more bipartisan support here in the United States. But there is a deep rift, I think, especially promoted by Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu and his former Ambassador Dermer uh, here in Washington. Ambassador Dermer recently said that Israel shouldn't really even bother with American Jews. It should focus on American evangelicals, Christian evangelicals, who are the real enthusiastic supporters of Israel. Israel has long been losing support among progressive Democrats. And now that progressive Democrats are in power, particularly in the House of Representatives, more, more and more so in the Senate, this is a problem for Israel. And you have a real split in elite opinion for the first time questioning, really questioning, deeply questioning the amount and uh, type of U.S. aid given to Israel and the amount and type of U.S. support given to Israel in the United Nation and other uh, other international bodies. Danny, let me ask you, the Israeli army has said that it's going to be presenting a plan uh, to political leadership for a potential ground operation. Um, do you expect that there will be a ground operation, um, an offensive in Gaza playing out in the days to come? So I served seven years ago as the Deputy Minister of Defense. And uh, every time you enter a, a cycle with Hamas, uh, you have to look at all options. Uh, but we will think uh, very carefully before taking uh, that uh, decision. Uh, we know the prices of such a decision. But uh, our main goal is to protect our citizens. The days when you had the uh, defenseless Jews uh, sitting in their homes are over. Today, we have a strong military a moral military. Uh, I don't think uh, we are considering it right now, but uh, if the operation will continue uh, and the brutal attacks uh, against innocent uh, civilians will continue, we will uh, have to think about it. And let me just say that we are trying to minimize the number of civilian casualties uh, and the Hamas is doing exactly the opposite. They are targeting the rockets and the missiles into civilian population. So we are, we are dealing with a terrorist organization it is hard uh, to continue to fight the way we are doing now, trying to minimize the civilian casualties. We keep all options on the table, but uh, as of now, it is not uh, being discussed yet in the cabinet. Ahmad, what do you think? Uh, from your vantage point, do you expect that there will be a ground offensive into Gaza? Uh, as bad as the situation is there right now, how much worse how much more dire do things become if there is a ground offensive? Well, the situation is becoming graver by the hour uh, as Israel, the occupying power, continues its uh, onslaught and unleashing all means of uh, lethal military aggression against the defenseless Palestinian civilian population. The reality is that uh, Israel has the upper hand and the reality is that the victims are mostly Palestinians. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves. The destruction and the uh, widespread uh, violations are being committed by that immoral army that has been occupying a people and denying them their rights for 50, over 57 years now. Uh, the reality uh, speaks for itself, and, and the world is slowly but surely coming to see this reality and seeing uh, Israel for what it is. Uh, an, an occupying uh, power that has a colonial enterprise on the occupied Palestinian territory with apartheid uh, tactics uh, aimed at controlling the population. So Israel, as you have seen uh, by all Israeli officials they have been speaking, will, will use and they excel in once uh, there is violence and uh, uh, carnage, they excel in these times. And uh, we think that... Uh, things are most probably going to become graver uh, by the hour.
Hillary, I want to pick up on something you were mentioning a few moments back in your previous answer. You were talking about elites in the Democratic Party. You were talking about progressives in the Democratic Party. Of course, there are these progressive voices, a growing chorus of progressive voices uh, in the Democratic Party in the U.S. that have been drawing parallels between the plight of the Palestinians and the injustices faced by black Americans. Um, you know, previous generations of Democrats, they did not do that. This was not something that was mm -hmm. discussed openly. How big a shift is this in, in the dynamic of the conversation, even amongst the political elites or the progressives in the party? I think there really there is a major shift. I think the uh, the two campaigns of Senator Bernie Sanders helped really provide, uh, in a sense, cover for uh, uh, Democrats, for even for progressive Jewish Democrats to really make their voices heard in terms of this kind of what Israel is doing to to both its Arab citizens, which is really important and I think shocking for American many American Jews uh, last night and to, uh, and this morning to see these images of how Arab citizens in Israel are being attacked, how their shops are being destroyed, how they're being lynched uh, in the streets. And even though certainly there's a lot of violence being perpetrated as well against Jewish citizens of Israel, these attacks against Arab citizens of Israel is giving further uh, further angst in a way to, to American Jews and to American Democrats uh, writ large. This is not something that historically has been part of the Democratic Party. I think Israel had done a very good job previously in keeping bipartisan support for Israeli politics, which really obscured a lot of what Israel was doing to both its Arab citizens citizens and to, and to the Palestinians. But today, you know, Netanyahu made his bet during the Obama administration. He bet against Obama. He bet with the Republicans. And today he's going to he's paying that price. There's real division, real change among the Democrats. We may not see that personally in President Biden himself, but you go one step one step below that, and there is real profound change. And I think it really does stem from Netanyahu's bet against uh, Barack Obama and with the Republicans. Danny, we are seeing these horrific scenes uh, play out uh, across many mixed communities, uh, deadly internal unrest uh, in these mixed communities across the country. I want to ask how concerned you are about that, because it's one thing to have a political ceasefire potentially on the horizon. This is something that, you know, once that hatred gets out into the communities and you see this kind of violence, it's much harder to stop, is it not? I'm very worried about the, the situation and everybody should be worried about it. First, I beg to differ with uh, Hillary. Uh, what we saw last night, uh, the attack against the innocent Arab, we all condemned it. But 99.9% .9 of the attack in the last few days came from uh, Arab uh, rioters against innocent Jews. It's not all the Arab population. It's a small minority, but most of the attacks were against innocent Jews in Jerusalem and in other parts of Israel. So we are worried about that because the Arab Israelis are citizens. They enjoy full rights in Israel. We have a Supreme Court uh, justice with Arab Israeli members of Knesset, uh, hopefully in the future maybe a minister. Uh, and to see those uh, pictures, uh, it's a problem because we believe in coexistence. We cherish what we built here together with the Arab Israelis. And in order to build their future together with us, you know, when they are attacking police forces, schools, uh, nurseries, uh, at the end they are attacking the, their own people and their own destination. So we should all be worried about it. We should all condemn uh, the violent attacks. And unfortunately, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the president made a, a, a quick condemnation, but I haven't heard condemnation coming from the leaders of the Arab society in Israel. They are silent. And that's a cause for a uh, worry for us. Ahmad, what, what's your response? Um, uh, how concerned are you about this violence that we're seeing in mixed communities that's playing out? Well, the uh, Arab Palestinians in, in Israel have been discriminated against uh, since the establishment of Israel. And this is a reality. There are hundreds of laws that's, that discriminate against them. And with the rise of uh, the right-wing uh, Israeli politicians and the settlers taking over the government in Israel, uh, we saw more and more violence and more and more free hand for the settlers to do whatever they want when it comes to uh, pr pushing forward their agenda and, and, uh, and uh, uh, giving them a free hand uh, to do these things. None of them are held accountable. We saw the Israeli police very keen 
to uh, attack Arabs when, when they take to the streets uh, and Palestinians when they take to the streets. But the police was completely absent when Arab properties were, uh, were attacked and when, when they are under attack all the time. Uh, the reality is that there is uh, a discrimination uh, regime uh, in, within Israel. Hundreds of law discriminate uh, against Arab and, and put Jews at a higher level, Israeli Jews at a higher level uh, than, than they a, are. And they, don't have, and they don't enjoy, they don't enjoy the same exact... Danny, Danny, just, enjoy just the exact one moment, please. Please let Ahmad finish, and I'll come back to you for your reaction. The reality and the laws speak for themselves. None of the Arabs can bring in, if they, they are married to, to, to someone who is uh, not Jewish, they cannot bring in their, their uh, husband or, or uh, wife inside Israel. But any Israeli around the world can, can do that, or Jew around the world mm. can do that. The reality is there, and, and uh, so many studies spoke about that. So All right, Danny, please. It first and Sorry, I'm, not, the, the, I'm, not, the, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're starting to, we're starting to run out of time. So I know that Danny wanted to respond to what you were saying. Please go ahead. Yeah, what uh, Mr. Fauci said just now, it, it's, it's a pure lie. Uh, we have uh, equal rights for the Arab Israelis. Uh, and the proof to that, that every year, we have dozens of thousands of applications of Palestinians who want to become Israelis because they know that here they will actually enjoy full freedom and they will live in a strong democracy. Uh, we don't have hundreds of laws against the Arab Israelis. How many of them were granted? If you look at every parameter, they are better off How many of them were granted? Yes, and today. All right, uh, Ahmad, if I, if I may, uh, Ahmad, please, if, if, if we I can may, just, just, yeah, because we're starting to run out of time. Hillary, please go ahead. If I may, the, the demographic changes in the United States and the focus that President Trump, the former President Trump, uh, forced Americans to, to confront in terms of white supremacy and police brutality, the demographic, demographic change within that context to see this white supremacy and this police brutality here in the United States and to see it happening in Israel. My, my, my colleague in Israel can say that it's, it's different. People are condemning things. It's, it, the laws are different, whatever it is. The reality is anybody with a cell phone can take a picture and the entire world can see it. And here in the United States, it is having a profound impact. The New York Times ran an, an op-ed yesterday by Peter Beinert. For the first time I've ever seen this in an elite in an elite newspaper calling for the right of return of Palestinians to Israel proper, to 1948 Israel. This is an enormous shift in public opinion here in the United States. And the Israelis bet on Trump and Trumpism, and it backfired. They now have a very serious political problem with their closest ally here in Washington. Ahmad, I cut you off before, but we only have about a moment left. So please just keep that in mind and please keep your response brief. What I wanted to say, first of all, uh, the, 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 none of the Palestinians were granted that citizenship that he speaks about. Some of them, they want unification with their families. They're not seeking Israeli citizenship. But none of them were granted that citizenship. And in fact, uh, it is in the, in the words of, of your guest in, from Tel Aviv that uh, Arabs bear the responsibility for the violence. This by itself shows how much discrimination is taking place including by officials that, that represent uh, the views of, of uh, being uh, acceptable and, and uh, being uh, uh, somehow uh, in the middle between, between Arabs and Jews. Mm. All right. We have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Uh, thanks so much to all of our guests, Danny Danon, Ahmad Hajazi, and Hilary Manleverett. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this and all of our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.